Thank you for the introduction and, of course, the invitation to be here today. Very excited about it. And um, yeah, today I will tell you more about the work that we do at the company, uh, where we look at wastewater monitoring and how it has the impact, the, the potential to impact the future of public health, um, as well as a little bit about my own personal journey uh, co-founding this startup uh, with a scientific background, um, which I think should be hopefully very interesting to those in the audience and to other students we'll be talking to tomorrow. Um, and the founding of the company came from a very simple idea. I was doing my PhD studies in the laboratory of Professor Eric Alm at MIT, and our area of expertise was the gut microbiome. So we were very used to thinking about poo as data. In fact, uh, our lab was processing poop from people, from animals, from each other <laughs> in, in the lab. Um, and from there, it was just a small step towards beginning to imagine, OK, if we can learn a lot about the health of a person by looking at their poop, what can we learn about the health of a community, of a city, of a town, if we look at their wastewater, which is our collective poop? And I love this quote from Victor Hugo, saying sewers are the conscience of the city, um, in, in his famous book, uh, the Le Miserable. Uh, beautiful, right? Because if we think about it for a moment, um, all of the healthcare data available out there that is produced from our activity going to the doctor, going to the hospital, all of that data is what is informing public health action today. But it's biased, it's not representative of everything happening in populations, and the sewers, on the other hand, hold no secrets. So that's, that's the potential here, that's the vision. Let's digitize all of that data using the molecular technologies that have been very well developed over the past several decades and applied to human samples, let's apply them to those environmental samples with the objective of producing wastewater intelligence to save lives. And we call it intelligence, right? Not just data. It's not just about producing sequencing files from the wastewater or other types of data. It's about transforming that into insights, into intelligence that allow us to do all of these amazing things. Prevent the next pandemic before it happens, um, detect and understand illicit drug use and manufacturing, improving national security by identifying man-made threats, um, making healthcare more equitable by identifying asymptomatic or invisible patient populations. This is especially important in countries like the US where healthcare is not universal where healthcare is a service that you procure, and many people are left out and literally invisible from the system. So um, I began this journey, as, as I mentioned before, as a PhD student doing research on wastewater epidemiology. And when I started doing this research, I didn't know that it would lead into the creation of a company. All I knew in the moment was that I, that I loved the potential of that research, that it was really fun because it allowed me, what I did as a PhD student is I, I co-founded a project that we call the MIT Underworlds Smart Sewers Project. And we got it funded uh, for uh, $4 million to be able to start this line of research at MIT in collaboration with six different laboratories across campus. So it was super fun to put together, you know, to, to create like the vision of this project. It was very fun to help, uh, to I basically I led the writing of this grant to, to fund the project. It was very fun for me to, to find my collaborators and put together the dream team, right, to, to make it happen. Um, and uh, what I didn't realize is that actually all of those skills, if you will, and activities that I was developing were actually going to be very important and helpful to then create a company. But at the time, you know, again, that was not the objective. I was just very much enjoying the process of doing the research. And it was only 
towards the end of my PhD that, um, that my, actually one of my collaborators in the project, Nusha Gailey, uh, and I realized that maybe there was something here beyond science and beyond uh, a publication. And, and we actually began, you know, this was a very uh, kind of lucky conversation because we got together for coffee one day and just began to talk a little bit more about like just personal things. And, and then she shared that she did not want to pursue an academic career. And I was like, oh, really? Well, oh, neither do I, actually. <laughs> um, and, and, and not only that, but that we both had the entrepreneurial bug. We had already been at MIT for a few years. We had already seen a lot of other students and researchers so sort of like spinning off something and we were intrigued, you know, we wanted to do it too. And thirdly, we both thought this, there was something about the wastewater project that maybe could be taken to market. So we launched the company in late 2017. Um, I was still officially a PhD student at the time. In fact, um, you know, I, I, I want to take just a little moment to, you know, there's, there's a case study that Harvard Business School wrote about the founding of Biobot, and this is uh, open and public, uh, so you can go and read more about it, uh, because it's a case study on, on how do you make the decision that you should create a company when it's not entirely clear. <laughs> like in our case, for example, uh, yes, we had some basic research done, you know, from, from the work done over the previous years, but we didn't have a product, a specific product to sell. It was not clear that this was anything other than science. And even, you know, even my PhD advisor who, who when, I, uh, you know, when I started my PhD and, and I expressed like, you know, I kind of like this entrepreneurship thing, you know, I want to create a company. Uh, in the beginning of my PhD, actually, he was against that idea and he said, just forget about it, right? <laughs> like, you're here, I'm paying you to do research and to focus on writing papers and, you know, helping me, like, yeah, with the lab activities. Like, you're not here to start a company, so just, like, put that out of your mind. Um, and as I was coming towards the end of my PhD, I think he had already changed his mind completely. He was like totally supportive, like saying like, yes, this is amazing. And, and actually, he, um, he worked with my thesis committee meeting, uh, with my thesis, thesis committee in order to get proper permissions for me to spend basically the last year of my PhD, pretty much focused on the, on the company formation rather than, you know, on other research, which was obviously made it happen. Uh, and that flip was, I think, you know, a couple of things that were very important. On one side, uh, another student had already created a startup. So he had gone through the experience of seeing a student form a startup, and he was very excited about that happening again. And secondly, MIT as, a, as an entire organization had embraced entrepreneurship at the highest possible level and all the way down. So, you know, he also knew that, you know, he became an advocate that sometimes a su successful PhD can be the formation of a company. It doesn't just have to be that you publish your papers or the, that you publish a lot of papers, right, or that you got a postdoctoral position somewhere or even a faculty position somewhere, that it can be to create a company. And, you know, I'm, I'm very happy and lucky to have been, to some extent, uh, part of that um, early movement, and I think it's a positive trend at MIT is that more and more students and you know highly highly trained scientific founders are creating their startups. Um, but yeah, let me tell you a little bit more about the research that we did at MIT, so you can see that you know there wasn't really anything ready for commercial work, but it was pretty cool. Um, so here we had one line of work around sampling of the wastewater. Um, we realized pretty quickly that the options available on the market to collect wastewater samples um, were not that great. Basically, you would need to spend about five to $15,000 for each sampling device, and they are basically a peristaltic pump <laughs> um, that puts water in a bottle. 
So very much over-designed and very expensive. So we're at MIT, we're surrounded by a lot of brilliant engineers, and we were like, no, 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 let's just make our own pump. <laughs> if it's just a pump, let's make our own pump, and let's not spend $15,000 per, per sampling device, because we want to make a bunch of them, and we want to put them all over the city, right, in different manholes to start collecting the data. So you can see here two generations of our sampling devices. The first one we call Mario, <laughs> like in the Super Mario Brothers uh, uh, video game. Uh, and it was designed to collect like six samples in parallel. And then, um, you know, we realized that actually maybe we just wanted one sample. You know, one sample per manhole was representative enough. There wasn't a lot of heter heterogeneity within the manhole. So instead of collecting like six samples to represent a manhole, we could just collect one sample to represent a manhole. So then we simplified the design to this little guy over here. Here's the diagram. And we call this one Luigi as being like slimmer than the, its predecessor. And we manufactured a bunch of these and used them for collecting all of our data across Cambridge, uh, Boston, Kuwait. Since they were the source of our funding, we did a lot of work in Kuwait. And that could be a whole other story. <laughs> and then um, so, Seoul, South, uh, South Korea as well. So um, we also, you know, we had a very fundamental question, which was, where do we collect the sample from, like in the in this town, right? So what we did in order to 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 answer that question is, we obtained the maps of the. This is the city of Cambridge in Massachusetts. And we basically collect the map of all of the sewer pipes um, and then overlay that data with demographic data and then created this tool so that we could basically click on a given manhole and then see what part of the city that manhole was catching in, in the catchment. And not only that, but also kind of the demographic information of that part of the city. So that allowed us to create basically a sampling plan where we knew exactly what manholes we needed to open in the town in order to represent which neighborhoods. And um, you know, this is something I always also like to share, which is sewer, sewer pipes and maps, this tributary map, is, the, was, is usually designed totally independent from whatever is happening above ground. <laughs> so, you know, th there isn't such a thing as collecting data, let's say, at the zip code level, because the underground system was not designed to reflect like, oh, these are going to be all of the connections from this zip code, right? It has its own way. So uh, s s wastewater data has its own geographic resolution that doesn't align perfectly with our other more standard geographic units, like census block, census, you know, like a zip, zip code, or even like town level, you know. You, you usually end up getting an approximation of that area, again, because the tributary maps aren't perfect. Um, and we basically, this also meant we spent a lot of time opening manholes, <laughs> as you can imagine. So uh, that was, uh, yeah, very unexpected. Uh, like, they are not that smelly. <laughs> they act actually, for some reason, really, they aren't. You know, like, uh, some bathrooms like, smell worse than a manhole. <laughs> um, they, they are always flowing. The water is always flowing. And on average, you know, if you're opening a manhole within a town, at least in, in Cambridge, um, the average travel time from a flush in somebody's toilet to the sampling point is about 15 minutes. So it's basically super fresh. It's always flowing. And <laughs> sorry, <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> like the data is super fresh. And, and yeah, you can just, you know, it's all about then how you collect, right? Your sampler needs to be able to aggregate over time. And the, the gold standard in the field is to collect 24 hour composite samples so that you're getting an aggregate of all of the toilet flushes that are passing through that sampling location. Uh, if you're sampling at a wastewater treatment plant, which is actually what most people do today, and also even ourselves. Um, the travel time is usually like about, on average, about, again, depending on the plant, but it's longer, right? It can be like 8 to 12 hours. 
um, of travel time, so that's going to have a consequence in the types of data that you can obtain. If you're sampling fresher, closer to the source, basically you can see still everything as if it was pee and poo. But if you go more downstream, there's going to be transformations, uh, degradation, that is dilution that is happening in the sewer that just leaves out some data. Um, so we brought you know, a lot of you know, advice, but we continued the development of a lot of these technologies. For example, here you can see some later iterations of our hardware device um, deployed in like real customer contracts in North Carolina, which was our first customer. Um, we developed assays in the lab um, because when, you know, when we founded the company, also we didn't know, okay, what exactly, what data are we going to collect and for whom? But very quickly we aligned on opioids, and I will tell you a little, a little bit about that in a moment, but just to close the, the loop on the founding story, um, this is a company founded by two women, very technical women who met at MIT. My own background is computational biology and microbiology, so I had done a lot of like genomics, you know, like a lot of that work in my, in my formation. Um, did my PhD in wastewater epidemiology, and my co-founder, Nusha, she is an architect and an engineer by background. An architect, I mean like building, <laughs> like building architect that had gone into the space of smart cities and you know, just like big data for like better city planning. So this was also from the get-go a very interdisciplinary effort and team. And I feel like that also has been an advantage uh, kind of in the founding and the growth of the company. Uh, but yeah, when we launched the company soon after, in early 2018, we raised our first round of funding so we went to a very famous accelerator called Y Combinator, which is in San Francisco. And um, after that, we basically met investors, we pitched to them, and we raised money. So we were able to go full time, to hire our first couple employees, um, and to start working on our opioids. Opioids are a specific type of drug that is highly addictive and that has cost a big overdose problem in the US and many countries around the world. So we started actually working on opioids um, as that was considered a priority for the US. And we were US-based, so even though we always saw ourselves as global, we had to start somewhere and we were there. <laughs> then, um, you know, you have seen here, you can see here kind of the additional funding we've been raising. So we're venture-backed and we fund our operations both from our sales, which we have a ton of like very real customers like including the US CDC, which is very, very rare for a startup that is like this young to be able to sell to a federal agency. But now Biobot actually holds three distinct federal contracts in the US, again, very, very successful. Um, and as well as our investment money. Um, but yeah, so we started with opioids and you know, just a, a funny thing I, I, I like to share is that when we started the company, we had been uh, looking at both bacteria, at bacteria, viruses, uh, chemicals, and we kind of began to have conversations with potential customers to understand where to start. Uh, well, first of all, government agencies, even though are kind of difficult to sell into, they were the, the only ones that were kind of excited to start to pay for this data even if it was not entirely clear how to use it. It was not the pharmas or the hospitals, it was government, which were like, all right, let's start there. Um, and secondly, um, the, the feedback we got is the US does not have an infectious disease problem. If you want to test for infectious diseases, maybe go you know, to Latin America, other places, other parts of the world, but here, we just don't have that. We're like, all right, well, it starts with opioids. <laughs> Um, and we spent the, our first year and a half and all of our money to develop an opioid solution. We were a team of five women at the time, and um, you know, just it was it was it was great. I mean, very, very difficult as you can imagine. We're a small team, and then of course, COVID started <laughs> in early 2020, and 
obviously now three years later, you know, like COVID-19 is our, so far our best-selling product and like, you know, has definitely amplified the landscape of wastewater. But at the time, we were a five-person startup, uh, you know, for which even, and we didn't know what to do. So just imagine this, you've spent your first year and a half building a product for the opioid epidemic, and then this COVID thing starts, and everybody's confused, right? <laughs> like, if you remember the early days of COVID, the, 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 the official statement from experts was that COVID-19 was going to go away very quickly. It was going to be a, a matter of a couple weeks, an acute event, but going to fizzle out real fast. We were, uh, my co-founder and I were actually with a top government public health official in the US in February of 2020, where we said, we put forward a proposal. We can start testing for this new virus in every airport or major airport in the US, like now, do you want to start? And they told us, don't waste your money. Like it's just, this is just, if you don't have it right now, it's too late, just don't even, do it, like I don't want it, like you know, this is going to go away very, very quickly. And we came back to a little office and we were like, so, okay, we're gonna still do it, right? <laughs> we we're like, yeah, let's go for it. Because if you're a startup, even if this new virus is going to really only last for a month, one month is a lot of time for a startup, right? You usually only have runway like one and a half to two years out. So one month is a long time. And we were like, yeah, let's go for it. So we partner up with my PhD advisor, Eric Om, and a bunch of different uh, collaborators in different universities to develop the first qPCR assay for COVID, for SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater. And we you know, began to get the wastewater in and everything and publish a preprint about our work in March 2020, like very quickly. Um, our, our preprint actually was the second one in the world. <laughs> and the first one came from our friends in the Netherlands. Um, uh, they beat us to it for like a couple of days. Um, so it was a very exciting time and it clearly took off from the first time that we published the preprint and we published a blog post and engaged you know, uh, social media. It just exploded, the interest exploded. And of course, the rest is history, right? Like you know, so much goodness came out of us doing the work. Um, we have the, the, the longest, um, and, uh, you know, most comprehensive data for SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater in the US. Um, this plot is actually a screenshot from a public dashboard that we share with just everybody. It's open to the public. And it shows two lines. The blue line shows the concentration of SARS-CoV-2 um, in the wastewater, measured as copies of uh, the RNA per mils of sewage. And then the other axis is daily new clinical cases. Wastewater, the wastewater data shown in is the blue line, and the clinical cases are, is the green line. And the x-axis, so we began to collect the data in March of 2020 and to present day we continue. And you can see a couple interesting things in this plot. So first is that in the beginning of the pandemic, the wastewater data captured sort of like that first wave of infections in a way that the clinical data did not capture. Because at least in the US, it took some time to build capacity to do clinical testing. Most of 2021, you can see here, and part of 2022, um, there was some correlation between, very good correlation between the wastewater data and the clinical data. In fact, in, in 2021, there was basically no difference. You could look at the one or the other and get the same trend. And this is because the clinical data was at its prime. There was a lot of testing available. It was free. People were highly encouraged to do it and people were doing it, right? At least, again, at least in the US, anybody with the slightest sniffle or whatever, you would run to get your PCR test done. And then finally, beginning in 2022, was the rise of the antigen tests, so where people could begin to test, you know, people who still cared to test, began to test at home. Um, but those tests are not reported. They are just for your own personal use. And so the, the two data sets began to diverge. 
This big peak was the Omicron variant, the Omicron peak. And you can see here how the wastewater data gave a two week living, living time into the peak in the clinical data and then even about four week time with the peak in hospitalizations. So the, this moment was, the, the data was just so critical and so important to alert and to give hope that the peak was gonna pass, um, that uh, we were in the front page of the New York Times. Like it was uh, a moment where I think we all felt like we had done something good for the world kind of thing, you know? Um, and then in later stages, you can see here how the clinical data actually now is so uh, deficient, so sparse, that the two data sets don't correlate anymore. And I think this paints the picture that wastewater, the relationship between wastewater data and a benchmark data set, maybe clinical cases, hospitalizations, prescription, right, is not going to be constant probably it's going to be evolving too. And that, uh, and that can be an impediment of wastewater getting adopted for more things. Because one of the first questions that people will have, that experts will have, is how much can I trust this data? And it's difficult kind of to prove that if when you're benchmarking, they kind of don't match. <laughs> um, we have also done uh, sequencing uh, kind of targeted sequencing of the SARS-CoV-2 genome in wastewater in order to call variants. Because the variants, that information was, has also been very important for government officials. Um, and the variants, some variants have sort of like uh, um, spread through the population just very quickly in a matter of a few weeks. And that's too short of a timeline to be developing PCR assays every time there's a new variant that did not make sense to us. So we went for sequencing. Um, definitely uh, our government officials, public health officials needed a bit of a moment to get used to now sequencing data, not just PCR data, but definitely a great choice of technology for the question. And you can see here, this is a subset of all of the data that we have, just representing the state of Massachusetts and a window of time. And, and the spread of all, the, all of the variants. And I'll just mention that all of the sequencing data that we collect through our contract with the CDC is published in the NCBI SRA, um, like annotated with date and time, you know, the, the date and the um, state from which it comes from. And interestingly, you know, as many other stories about data, uh, no academic has written a paper about it yet, even though all the data is there and we talk about it all the time. <laughs> so again, the importance of, you know, the data should not ideally be used just in the moment, you know, for critical response, but also for more research, and sometimes that, that is not quite connected. We also have been testing for a, a virus called monkeypox or mpox, um, that uh, there was a big outbreak in the US last year. You can actually see here how uh, you know, cases was looking like and how the wastewater concentration was looking like. And this is a very different virus to SARS-CoV-2. This is a skin infection. Uh, this is uh, actually very lowly prevalent in the population, very rare. And uh, therefore, we, have, we only show the data aggregated at the regional level because it's just very rare. <laughs> Fortunately, it's been like largely negative across the board, but interestingly, so Mpox uh, is, uh, is, is not asymptomatic. So if you have a case of Mpox in a specific location, you will see it in the clinic eventually because it's, it's symptomatic. And, and interestingly, um, that made it a model to understand the limit of sensitivity of the wastewater. And it's incredibly sensitive. I mean, we have consistently detected uh, positives in in, in regions where there's a single case of Mpox, which really allows us to say, yeah, wastewater allows you to have single patient resolution at, the, at that population level, which is incredible. Um, and finally, uh, the, the space, there's a whole space outside of infectious disease of substance use, which is actually the area where we began as a company, uh, where we spent uh, our first 
year and a half, and where we have kind of continued to develop in parallel to the infectious disease side of things. But you know, the, the insights that we can get are just incredible. You know, just I'm going to give you an example here. So this is a map of the U.S. Um, each dot represents a community that we're sampling and testing, and the color maps to a cluster or a group that was identified via like machine learning, unbiased machine learning. You can see here the legend of kind of a spider plot that defines each group. And then here's kind of our annotation, our interpretation of what each group means. And you know, in the US, it's sort of like well known that the West Coast um, likes meth, and the East Coast likes fentanyl. And actually, yeah, this sort of matches that. In a sense, this, this purple cluster has high meth use. And the, fent and the blue cluster has high fentanyl use, right, as compared to the, to the cohort. But that was sort of like not the only substance getting consumed, according to our machine learning analysis. Like the purple cluster also had high morphine use. Morphine in the wastewater is largely coming from heroin. So heroin largely like metabolizes into, into morphine and nicotine, a lot of like smoking or maybe vaping with, with nicotine. And then fentanyl was high also with cocaine. Um, not only that, I mean, we identified there was co-consumption potentially uh, or co-use of substances, but also um, there's a bunch of blue dots on this side. There's a bunch of like other types of consumption on the East Coast, so again, uh, this is an evolving landscape, right? This is not fixed and we are kind of learning completely new things so there's just no other way to understand. Um, and just just this week actually we kicked off a new program where we will be doing at the national level substance use analysis uh, as supported by a federal agency in the US, which is very exciting. Um, very quickly, just uh, kind of high level how it works is uh, there's, there's a kit I'm not sure if people here have heard about the 23andMe company, like that, uh, you know, where you can submit a saliva sample and you get your results back, uh, your, your genomic results back. Well, similarly, we have like a kit, a standardized kit to send it out to the sites that collect the samples. We receive all of the samples in our laboratory. We do either qPCR sequencing or mass spec analysis, right, depending on what's needed. We analyze the data and report it back out um, to our partners. And this is kind of where we're going. So right now, we're in this kind of phase one of having a domestic central lab in the Boston area of being mostly doing targeted assays. We want to move into kind of a global network of partner labs, uh, as well as uh, that global data platform. Because if you, if you remember kind of the beginning of my presentation, I said, we want to stop pandemics before they happen. And that is not, that mission cannot happen if we solely focus on in one country. Right? We need to work across multiple countries. Um, as well as more agnostic assays, like, right, that's kind of my background, is to be dealing with like sequencing files or metabolomics files. We want to be able to go back to that. And then um, I think in the future, either us or others, because this is a problem that is getting worked through at different levels, like a network of, you know, complement the laboratory analysis with also data coming from remote sensing capabilities. They, they will not be able to um, replicate kind of all of the data that we can obtain in a lab, but they could be screening methods for us to do additional analysis in the lab or, you know, other, other applications of that as well as more predictive analytics, right, to go beyond the descriptive of what's happening now or historical analysis into kind of more forecasting and modeling. So, yeah, in the last few minutes that I have, I will just talk about um, just a couple of uh, kind of research areas we have in the space of more agnostic technologies rather than targeted, which is metagenomics and high-resolution mass spectrometry. So. Um, on metagenomics, you know, we had just some basic questions. 
what is the raw abundance of non-SARS-CoV-2 pathogens in wastewater, you know, what is the threshold for detectable, how is this defined, and you know, can we test our initial metagenomics pipeline, and can we test it on published data? So rather than producing not new data right now, let's kind of look, let's process and analyze existing published data. So this is the data that went into our analysis. You can see here, it represents sort of like different geographies, different types of wastewater, uh, different uh, ex uh, nucleic acid extraction, and um, also if they were particularly targeting viruses in the wastewater or just like shotgun sequencing and just whatever was, was there. And this is what the results of our pipeline and bioinformatic analysis show. Uh, you know, first we detected a wide variety of viral and bacterial pathogens. You can see here a list going from SARS-CoV-2, um, monkeypox that we have been testing for on, you know, targeted a bunch of different pox viruses, hepatitis C, polio, hepatitis E, RSV, HIV, noroviruses, different genotypes, uh, gonorrhea, Clostridium difficile, right? So a wide variety of bacterial and viral pathogens present in different geographies. Um, obviously, the GI viruses are very, very abundant. <laughs> um, in fact, in our, in our own, right now, BioBot is already testing for norovirus G1 and G2, and it's in, in our hands and in the US, it's orders of magnitude more abundant than SARS-CoV-2 which was incredibly surprising because norovirus, you know, usually how the disease manifests itself is isolated infection clusters. So we didn't know what to expect, but definitely did not expect that it's just high level all the time in the population. It means like it's literally everywhere around us and for some reason some people get sick um, and most of us just see it and don't get sick. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, so that was nice. And there was a lack of correlation between abundances and expected geographic distributions. So we need to iterate, you know, like the tool and probably also the assay, right? To make sure that the assay, it's really like optimizing what, for what we're looking for. Um, and yeah, you can see here, these were some of the most abundant, abundantly detected pathogens, right? So SARS-CoV-2, the noroviruses, this streptococcus pneumonia, which has a lot of development pipeline in pharma companies. So this could be definitely like something that they care about. Um, this is something that they care about. PMMV, you know, I didn't really go in details into that, but this is a virus that infects tomatoes and bell peppers and therefore makes its way into our GI tract via, via food, via our diet. And we actually test PMMV in every single sample that we also test for other things because it, it is a, a fecal normalization marker for us. So the data that I show in the big plot, that is data normalized as SARS-CoV-2, normalized by PMMV. That's what allows you to correct for dilution and other things. So um, also you can see here how the sample type seem to really not matter which has been a big debate in the, in the wastewater epidemiology field is like what, what sample is kind of the best. Um, so yeah, and, and, and finally on the, on the chemistry side of things, we wanted to be able to understand um, you know, what, what type of small molecules we're seeing in the wastewater and not only that, can we quantify if we switch from targeted mass spec to untargeted mass spec, can we still quantify or not? So you can see here kind of the results of those experiments. Uh, first is, this is for a one molecule in our panel, cocaine. Uh, we're comparing how cocaine is getting quantified via our targeted method today versus the untargeted method. And fortunately, we can still quantify. So that's great. And secondly, not only we can get like, you know, right now we have a panel of about maybe five or six substances. So that means that we can basically switch to this new method, still quantify those five or six substances, but 
get hundreds of other substances at the same time. And you can see here kind of the categories, right? Prescription drugs, Ill illicit drugs, um, pesticides, personal care products, you know, a bunch of different things. So it's literally, there's literally like a wealth of information for us to be able to get out of wastewater. Um, and finally, just our like near-term product roadmap, we're optimizing for uh, biomarkers that where there's an overlap between what the public health departments want and what pharmaceutical companies are working on. This is important for two reasons. One is it allows us to commercialize our product with both markets. Secondly, um, well, if we're detecting things, ideally there should be solutions for it, right? So uh, working on pathogens for which there's a pipeline for therapeutics or vaccines with pharma is just means that there will be a solution uh, and an action when this is detected in a population. And yeah, just to say, you know, obviously we're very happy that we were a big part of why um, there, there was good data <laughs> for SARS-CoV-2 during the pandemic. Um, but this is just the beginning for us. Like, you know, we believe that this is the moment to double down, to invest, to expand because our communities are vulnerable and um, you know, climate change and urbanization, right? Migration to cities, there's just many, many movements that make it a no-brainer to invest in this type of technology and to transform sewers into this intelligence. So um, we're busier than ever. And as mentioned in the intro, also looking for partners in different countries. So if there's anybody in the audience who thinks, you know, who works on this or who wants to talk more with us, just please do reach out. So thank you. I guess, yeah. <laughs>